Hi, uh, welcome back. So, so far we have looked at uh, data sets, tokenizers, then even trained a mini GPT uh, style model. Now we are going to look at uh, uh, something which is uh, what you would do more often. Right? The training is something that uh, you may not do so often, but fine tuning uh, a model, uh, prompting it and so on is something that you would do more often because you would want to adapt it to downstream tasks. Right? So let's see uh, what this means and uh, let's look at some uh, sort of uh, theory or context before we get into the hands-on part. Right? So we have looked at pre-training, uh, we trained the GPT-2 model uh, with the causal language modeling objective and for all samples in the data set, uh, we sort of minimized the uh, log likelihood, right? Uh, so, sorry, maximize the, uh, minimize the negative log likelihood, right? So uh, can be adapted to different downstream tasks now. So I want to do classification. This is a general purpose uh, model that I have trained and it only knows, it has only been trained on next token prediction. Now I wanted to do sentiment classification, right? which is given a sentence, tell me whether it's positive or negative, named entity recognition, which meaning given a sequence of tokens, uh, identify all the tokens which are named entities and which named entity is it, is it a name of a person or an organization, date, etc. Right? Uh, then some text generation tasks like question answering, translation, summarization and even conversational tasks right? where you are trying to use it in a sort of a chatbot environment. Right? These are all the tasks that uh, modern LLMs are used for. So, how do we go from this uh, sort of uh, pre-training that we did to making it uh, work for all of these tasks? So, one approach uh, is to what is known as fine-tune the model. So, what do we do in that is that you have done the pre-training, you have trained some LLM, BERT, GPT, BART, pick whatever is your favorite uh, LLM and now you take that you look at a task specific data set which is say for the sentiment classification task you are looking at the Stanford sentiment tree bank you pass it through the model and you uh, have the labels also associated with it so you have the sentence and the label and then you back propagate right so that's that's what you would do or you could take the uh, SNLI task where you want to predict whether sentence 1 and sentence 2 have one of these three relationships, right? So entails, contradicts, or neutral. Uh, there is no relationship, right? Uh, again, you could do the same thing and back propagate. So you have X as well as Y, and now using this, you can treat this as a standard classification task and take the pre-trained model as just like the weights are initialized from pre-training, and from their point, uh, from that point onwards, you are just fine-tuning the model, right? Uh, or fine-tuning for that specific task, and you could do this for multiple. Uh, tasks, right? Um, so each time you will make a copy of the model and fine tune it for that task. So if you want to fine tune for text classification, let's see what would uh, what you would do. The goal would be to do this uh, with minimal or no change in the architecture. Right? So in your corpus of your label data, you have a sequence of tokens and then a label Y associated with it, and you have many such sequence, comma, label pairs available with you, right? So now you're just going to initialize the parameters with whatever pre-trained model you had after pre-training. And then you could, uh, at the input, you may want to add some spatial tokens, like, okay, this is the start of the sentence, this is the end of the sentence. This may be useful for certain tasks. For example, if it's a two sentence task, where sentence one, does it entail sentence two, then you would want to mark the boundaries of the sentence. Right? So you can ask these, uh, add these spatial tokens and then use the same uh, uh, forward pass, right, which is, all of these computations are happening using the weights that you have already pre-trained uh, during uh, pre-training, right? And then at the output, you could have a layer which just acts as an output layer and it will output one of the two classes that you are interested in. Let's say this is uh, the sentiment prediction task and you only want to predict positive or negative. So, it will just predict a distribution over these two labels, right? And then you will back propagate through the entire network. That means these additional parameters that you have added plus the original parameters of the model plus the embedding matrix, everything will get updated to minimize this loss. Right? That means to improve your uh, prediction on the training data. So this is what we are doing. Uh, and we could take the output at the last time step. Right. So this last time step is what of the last layer is what I'm treating as the representation for the uh, sentence, right? Because it's a causal language model. So at the last token, it has seen all the previous tokens and sort of aggregated information from there. So now this has 
sort of all the information about the sentence and using that I want to predict the label whether it's positive or negative, right? Um, and we can then use the standard cross entropy loss to uh, sort of uh, uh, do the back propagation and then update the parameters of the model, right? Okay. Now there are a few choices here, right? One is you could say that, oh, I've already invested a lot of thing in training this pink portion here. So why should I sort of uh, uh, change that, right? And if I try to change that, everything that it has learned previously, it may forget, right? And just to specialize on one task, I don't want to sacrifice this entire thing, which I have learned uh, using a lot of compute, lot of data, right? So in that case, you freeze all the parameters of the transformer and only train the newly added parameters, which is WY in this case. Right? And it makes sense because you have smaller amount of data. So it makes sense to just train a smaller amount of parameters with it. That's one. The other is given that the model has already learned a lot from previous data, you don't want to disturb that. Right? So this is the other two motivations for using sort of what is known as freezing the backbone or not updating the parameters of the backbone and just updating the newly added uh, parameter. Right? And in, in that case, uh, this, this uh, pre-trained model is just acting as a feature extractor because you're passing the sequence, it's going through this entire forward propagation, all the computations are happening and at the end you're getting a feature vector here and now based on that feature vector you're doing the classification and only this part is what is getting trained, right? The, feature vector and the, uh, uh, sorry, the feature vector is being fed into this simple WI parameter and only those parameters are being trained, right? So uh, you could think of this as offline also. You can just take your entire training data, pass it through this network, get the feature vector and then just sort of uh, uh, operate on this layer where you are just doing a back propagation on WI, right? So that's why it acts as a feature extractor if you are freezing the entire network and that's more common to do. You could also do what is known as full fine tuning where you're going to fine tune the entire network, not very common to do, especially if you're dealing with like a 13 billion or 30 billion parameter model, it doesn't make sense to sort of go and adjust the entire uh, model, right? Um, although, yeah, I mean, in practice, it does give better performance, but it's still not recommended, right? And uh, there are better ways of doing this, which we'll talk about uh, soon. Yeah. So, this is fine, right? I mean, you might want to fully fine tune a, a model which you have pre-trained and this makes sense for like smaller models like 124 million parameter GP2 model, right? let's call it GP2 small, but there are other variants of the uh, model, right? Uh, even the GPT2 model, a uh, small model requires around 3 to 4 GB of uh, GPU memory, right? And that too just with a batch size of 1. Typically, you would use larger batch sizes and anything larger than 10 here would become prohibitive, right? Because it would, uh, but of course, some of this is uh, uh, not the batch uh, memory occupied by the training data, but it's also the parameters of the model and so on. But anyways, it requires some amount of memory. So you have to be mindful of that. If you are going to use larger models, right? Uh, say the extra large model, which has, I think, uh, 1.5 uh, uh, GB, right? Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, 1.5 uh, uh, giga parameters. Uh, that uh, would be very difficult to fit on a memory on a single GPU, right? So it requires at least 22 to 24 GB of GPU memory, and that too with a batch size of uh, one, right? So then passing the entire data through it, fully fine tuning it, it becomes very expensive if you do not have access to enough compute power, right? So with this is good to do from an experiment perspective, good to say that yeah, fully fine tuning gives the best performance and all that, but in practice it would become uh, uh, infeasible, right? So you have to be mindful of that. So, and you can't do this for very, very huge models, right? Because uh, there's a 175 billion parameter model also available. How will you do it? And some, uh, for example, the LAMA uh, 3.0, the LAMA uh, 405 billion parameter model, you need around 16 GBs, uh, 16 GPUs just to load the model, right? And then imagine doing something on top of that, it's computationally very prohibitive, right? It's very expensive to uh, do that. 